Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, we have a wonderful panel, and we want to get started so that we can actually get to things on time, and you can see everything and the whole array of um, wonderful people who we have with us today. Um, I'm going to really just sort of dive straight in to the deep end here. And god, I'm so loud. Um, I don't even need this. Um, so I, this panel was essentially made out of a decision to transition from issue one of SAG, which was called Disaster Timeline, the issue one of volume two. And it, it, was, it was capped off by, um, by an essay that I wrote. I edited the issue. Um, I was the ed 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 editor for it. And the, the essay, if, if anybody has read it, you will um, realize that it's essentially an exercise in, uh, in whip whiplash. Um, and I had over eight years that I transferred into an experimental form of the essay. And because I don't really need to quote or read the essay, I can just make you understand what some of that was all about. Um, so yesterday, I, I woke up and I was thinking, of course, about this event and the first thing that, the first thing that I noticed on my phone um, when I woke up was actually, you know, the Reuters notification because for some reason it's a pushy. And, I, you know, the first thing that I find out is that Biden has authorized the transfer of billions of dollars worth of bombs. I'm quoting here. Um, authorized the transfer of billions of dollars worth of bombs and fighter jets to Israel. New arms packages, which include more than um, 1,800 MK-84 2,000-pound bombs and 500 MK-82 500-pound pound bomb bombs. On the same day, Biden, on Friday, acknowledged, and again, quoting, the pain being felt by many Arab Americans over the war in Gaza. Um, the whiplash there stays on one level. And at the same time, of course, I find out, because I'm looking at the headlines that Congress party in India has called the state's income taxation of the party tax terrorism, that's what they called it. And, and, it, and they, they, they called it an attempt by the BJP to cripple um, the Congress party for the upcoming parliamentary elections. At the same time, um, I also, so soon thereafter, I re began to read a piece by um, Gayotra Bahadur who is um, a dear friend and a board, board member of, of SAG, um, who wrote in the New York Times about Guyana being remade and modernized, essentially, by the revenue generated by Exxon, Mo Exxon Mobil's um, recent, like the past few years, a few years ago, having struck oil, finally. Um, and of course, as this is happening, I'm actually also finding out um, from the editor of issue two, Sabika Abbas, who was supposed to be here to introduce everything to you, um, but had to fly back to India for her minor surgery, for a minor surgery, and I was talking pain management with her. And at the same time, I realized that I had to prepare for a number of things, and I had to think about a number of things, and also that I had missed three deadlines, and that all those personal frustrations really just sort of made it all excessive and, and hard. And the purpose, I think, of scaling from the nation state to, the, to, the, to a political party, to an oil company, to an individual, to individuals across the globe, the purpose of this is essentially to indicate our understanding of disaster and how much it affects us. And we see that in each of the panelists' works as well. We, we see that conception of disaster that I'm putting forward, and we are all putting forward as, 
as a, as a broad category, and we're, and we're seeing that, well, okay, this exists, and we've been talking about it now for quite some time, but what do we do? One of the things that my essay discusses is that climate nihilism and the conception of, of climate pessimism that is being pathologized nowadays um, and evoked by many people is not a sentiment that we should dismiss simply because we do not like it. Because as academics and climate activists have gotten very used to doing, they, they will talk about all the terrible, terrible, terrible things happening, and then you know, if somebody is anxious or depressed about it, um, they'll be like, no, we really believe in optimism. We have to do this. And then there's a lot of buzzwords that we fall back on, because how else are we going to deal with it? And this panel is about thinking about the concept of solidarity. It's very easy for us to talk about what, the, about being in solidarity with some, some, somebody or groups of people, but what do we mean? What is the history of that? And in the planning of this panel, I encountered uh, the, the history, essentially, of, of, of solidarity in a, in, in a capitalistic form, formation um, in Tehila Sasson's uh, wonderful, wonderful upcoming monograph um, that I hope you, can, you, you will pre-order at the, at the entrance. She, she calls it stakeholder capitalism, which in the post-colonial era emerges out of the left. And I think if you read the book, and I will, you know, want to hear more about uh, Tahila's thoughts on the matter. You'll, you'll see traces of that in our own thinking and organizing as well, which complicates the legacy in many ways of solidarity. Um, Suchitra's book um, is about Indian political prisoners, and it uses very specific voices. Um, of people to tell a very painful story, obviously, of, of, their, of their repression, their detention, their <laughs> servitude, uh, their the enslaved conditions. Um, but it, is, it, it, it was an intriguing claim, I remember, when she talked about how authoritarianism in the context of India and historical revisionism go hand in hand. And I remember thinking at that moment that historical revisionism goes hand in hand with a lot of things. And it seems to me that in some sort of pre-authoritarian state or pre-authoritarian moment, you can see the emergence of historical revisionism. And I was wondering when does that, where else do we see it? And that, of course, is something that Azad, Azad's book does extremely well in connecting India as a state and Israel as a state, right? India, where we're thinking about fascism <laughs> in a much more contemporary context in a certain sense, um, and authoritarianism. And the connections that Azad, that Azad makes are with very keen journalistic insight are, they're very specific. I mean, the, the relations between these two states are very, very fine-grained. They involve talks and deals and negotiations and that go back many, many years and a lot further than we would like to think, and therefore implicating more than just the authoritarian state of India as we would define in the contem contemporary moment, but the state in a historical legacy as well. And then I was reading Hiba's book alongside the others, of course. And I, I have to bring this up because I think that it makes a, a, a very intriguing connection to why we want to talk about solidarity. So Hiba's book, and, and she'll tell you more about it in, in a moment, is, is about refugees and people who are people who are not, not, not just refugees, uh, people who are essentially re resettled, that, you know, the other category. Um, 
you know, so it's especially particularly from the Syrian civil war. And, you know, as, as the so sociological inquiry is like, it's, n it's a wonderful method for a, a historian, the, the stories in it are, are very evocative and they reminded me of something, especially when every time you would zoom out from Syria in particular, it reminded me of something that Saag has always held, all of us as in general, as a team. And that is that for some, for whatever reason, well, we know what the reasons are, but the cultural cachet of a certain segment of the diaspora is, can be quite universalizing, right? I mentioned Guyana earlier. Um, Gayotra Bahadur is, is Guyanese. Um, Hiva, you, you, many of the people you, you speak to are likely not representative of the, the Syrian um, intellectuals, diasporic intellectuals that we might hear from. Um, and, and I think that's true for so many diasporas. But if we think about South Asia in particular, and we broaden out, we begin to realize that the Indian American population seems to have this very large cachet over what the diaspora looks like. What, what does an immigrant look like? And we, so we see this in fiction and we see this in our works, but when you see the stories in Hiba's book, it kind of explodes that category, and you realize that it's not just that every country has a diaspora of everybody else, but also that your own country contains hierarchies that we are not particularly talking about. And it is in that context, I think, that solidarity becomes complicated and naughty, and a place where I think would be generative for us to start. So I would love to ask, well, begin, hmm. how do I do this? Why can't I work my camera? Okay. I would love to ask the panelists, I'm just gonna sit down and get away from my notes because they just distract me. <laughs> um, if we could talk a little bit about, if you could describe your book and your intent when starting it, and if that differed, and what, what was that intent? What was the thing that you were trying to trying to interrogate and look into. Um, and it, it was that different from, from the book that, that, is, that is out now or about to be out now? And, and if so, what is the difference? But, but yes, I would yeah, I'd love to start with, with your... Yeah, well, unless you don't want me to. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for um, hosting this panel and this event. It's obviously very timely, um, given all of the events in, in Gaza, um, today being land day as well. And so the, you know, the, the idea of solidarity um, is obviously very important uh, at this moment. And so I'm very grateful to be here, my fellow panelists and all of you. Although I can't see you, I'm blinded. Um, uh, you know. Um, that's a, it's a bit of a, t it's an easy question and a, and a tough question because um, I am, I'm from South Africa and, um, and so I was brought up with this, uh, and, uh, and of course my, my great grandparents were from, um, uh, from the subcontinent, meaning Gujarat, this was pre-partition, pre-India, uh, pre pre-Pakistan, pre-all of that. And so um, uh, growing up, in South Africa during apartheid, at the end of apartheid, um, my, uh, I, was, I was brought up with a sort of unhealthy diet of Gandhi and Nehru and, uh, the <coughs> and the role that the, the Indian government had played um, even prior to 47, as in the incoming Indian government, played in terms of speaking out about racism in South Africa. And so uh, we were told that you know India was one of the first countries that spoke out uh, against racism, um, and it also pushed for sanctions on uh, South Africa. In, in, in 1990, when Nelson Mandela was released, uh, he uh, South Africa uh, India was the first country that actually ended sports uh, s the sports boycott on on South Africa. So these are things that you s that stick with you, and so so we're talking about solidarity, and of course. Um, this idea of this big country that's meant to be the leader of the global south, 
uh, that has you know, shown so much of material support for the anti-apartheid cause, right? So you remember these things growing up. Um, I still remember think, uh, watching the first game between South Africa and India, the first cricket match you know, in 1990, following the end of the boycott. So these are, these are important things, that, the, that something doesn't change or something doesn't develop, um, things don't normalize until something gives. You know? this, is a thing, this is something that sticks with you. So if you think about the normalization deals between the, the Gulf uh, countries and Israel, where nothing has actually changed and actually become worse, this is the opposite in a way. But um, uh, and, and as part of the narrative, we also, I also grew up with the idea that India was very close to the Palestinian cause as well. So fast forward, um, you know, me becoming a journalist and learning more about Kashmir and being very like, shocked by this idea that India uh, as a country that's a leader of the non-aligned movement and um, anti-colonial and all of those things um, is running an occupation right, in the neighborhood and where there's 700,000 troops, and uh, there are things, concepts like, unheard of concepts like half widows, and uh, thousands have disappeared, and 50,000 people killed. I don't know if this answer is too long. But, um, but having discovered Kashmir, and then finding that India, you know, uh, that India was not exactly how it was panned out, right, <laughs> or, uh, or, or kind of um, uh, described, right? Um, I started writing about Kashmir and found that I, I, ha had I faced a lot of opposition from Indian journalists and editors regarding this. And s the same type of editors who were quite okay with writing about Palestine. All right? And so, um, in, in, so I kind of discovered that self-determination for some people was fine as so long as it didn't interfere with your nationalism. All right? And so uh, now moving on to Modi and getting specifically to your question, um, Modi becomes prime minister and India and Israel become closer like quite emphatically and quite openly. So it becomes easier to write about these ties. But then when I finally d decide to write this book about India and Israel ties, I went in with the assumption that India was actually close to Palestine um, in, 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 terms of pr in, in a principal way, right? And I was quite shocked to find that they were not, it was not the case. That was just completely driven by self-interest. One being that they needed oil from the Arab world, and second one being that they didn't want the Arab world to become closer to Pakistan when it came to the question of Kashmir. Okay? Um, and it was, there was also a certain currency to being seen as close to Palestine if you want to be the leader of the anti-colonial movement. Right? So that's how, I mean, in terms of you know, your question about how the book, like how I imagined the book, I imagined it that I'll be writing a book that talks about how India moved from this anti-colonial position um, <laughs> and kind of sold out its soul in a way, but I found that actually that's also a, a fib. And that story about India being um, one of the first countries to sp speak about, anti, uh, uh, about racism in South Africa, that's also a half-truth. Because when it first spoke about racism in South Africa, it spoke about racism against Indian people in South Africa. It did not speak about black people in South Africa, mm -hmm. which is incredible. So kind of the book kind of under, you know, tries to uncover all of these half-truths and how, and how anti-colonialism has been, or the concept has been shaped for us as well. The idea, there's a box around anti-colonialism, mm -hmm. and someone has made it up for us. Sorry for the long answer. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's a great answer. I. Um, I'm just going to put people on the spot. Sorry about that. Um, Tahila, I, I, <laughs> I was wondering, and because I feel like he, he, what Azad is saying is he's giving so many examples of the expression of solidarity is clearly not mutually exclusive from accommodationism and extremely close ties. <laughs> and that, in your book, is a very fascinating thing. I mean, we're talking about the, the sort of, um, you, know, you know, solidarity, solidarity capitalism or sort of solidarity socialism, and what does that mean? And what, does, what is the left accommodating with in the post-colonial moment? In, in Britain and in the globe on the global stage, there that allows it to to posit a certain front while being quite different, really. Yeah, but it also lets another book. Yeah. Oh, first, thank you. <laughs>
thank you for uh, inviting me and for the opportunity to engage also with, with you all and learning from you all. Um, I don't know if I have like a, a clear take on solidarity as a whole, so I'm a historian. <laughs> I'm a historian of the British Empire um, and of decolonization, and I'm interested in particular in understanding the legacies of empire and of decolonization in shaping uh, racial and economic inequalities in our world today. Um, and as a historian, I think I, I come to the concepts of solidarity thinking that it is a, is a very, uh, it's a concept that changes over time and it has uh, different applications over time, right? So I don't think that there is a trans like universalized or normative understanding of solidarity that is always true. I mean, I think that there is radical, I mean, as, as a political person, I think that there is radical possibilities for solidarity, but I also think that there are limits to it. Um, and I'm really interested in what you were saying as that, because I think that there is, I think it's not just solidarity. I think, uh, I think that there is ways in which we discover that you can both be an oppress people mm -hmm. and oppress others. You can be in solidarity with some people, or like I guess it's it's an exercise of political imagination of who do you imagine are part of your people, and who are you imagining even are actual people, <laughs> and who is being unimagined or written as as not worthy of of solidarity. Um, so I, I mean I have a lot of thoughts. I have a, also a lot of thoughts about like the historical formation of how Israel has marketed itself. Uh, historically throughout the 50s and 60s during the period of decolonization um, as a country that could be seen by Biafrans during the Nigerian Biafran Civil War as, as a potential liberatory project rather than an oppressive project and, and what that means. But um, I'll just say a couple of words about my own uh, book. So my book looks at um, uh, the nonprofit sector, and particularly uh, humanitarian aid organizations or NGOs uh, like Oxfam, Save the Children, uh, Christian Aid. There's a large kind of uh, NGO sector, particularly in Britain, and I follow how that NGO sector developed in Britain during the period of decolonization and and after, um, out of uh, a certain type of. Um, uh, old imperial network, so a lot of the experts that came to work in those NGOs were employed by empires. But I follow how these NGOs try to kind of remake world order through uh, um, what Kamal said, uh, kind of stakeholder capitalism. And they were very much influenced and inspired by uh, socialist thinking. So solidarity is a, is, a, is a political concept that was particularly, I mean, I, I think its origins are not just in socialist thinking, but a lot of it has developed through so socialist thinking in the late 19th century. And a lot of these NGOs really kind of were inspired by um, the cooperative movement uh, uh, by by thinking about how to change uh, the the world market uh, after empire. What would that world look like? As well as reading and engaging with postcolonial thinking. So they, they actually read a lot uh, uh, Gandhi and uh, Vinoba Behev and like you know basically Gandhi and followers thinking about Swadeshi and what would uh, indigenous manufacturing would look like um, on on a global scale. And I follow how they tried to kind of create solidarity markets, um, so fair trade markets, so, so sort of like the, the origins of, of what today we would consider fair trade. So I look at like fair trade of handicrafts, of uh, food like coffee, like uh, tea, you know, they ran various campaigns to support uh, uh, Sri Lankan uh, uh, workers uh, in tea estates, uh, as well as corporate social responsibility. Um, and I look at both like the intellectual origins of it, so the potential of what they were trying to achieve, as well as the political economy of th these actual solidarity markets and how they, um, in, in essence, failed. Um, and so I don't know if my, my take is necessarily that solidarity as a whole is a, is a problematic concept, but the way that it was applied by these NGOs uh, was very problematic because what happens is, is that a lot of these uh, solidarity markets, so uh, let me give you some examples so you can imagine concretely what I'm talking about. I look at how Oxfam, for example, worked with um, uh, uh, female handicraft workers in Gujarat um, to produce handicrafts that would be then marketed to British consumers and how they kind of encouraged them to fit uh, those 
products to the British taste and then created a, an entire apparatus of fair trade or charity shops, it's called in Britain, uh, apparatus of fair trade shops um, and tax exemptions that would then uh, be marketed to uh, the British consumers. But then I look at how a lot of these solidarity markets ended up supporting poor labor conditions, child work, um, low wages, and in essence, they were unregulated. So I guess, uh, yeah, I, I look at the, the limits of this kind of non-governmentality on a global scale and say, you know, like this is, it didn't have this kind of structural uh, change, but rather it was unregulated and ended up like supporting ideas that we would today associate with neoliberal thinking, like entrepreneurship, um, indiv individualism, rather than real structural reforms. The same goes for campaigns for corporate social responsibility. So I guess solidarity for me and the limits of it, I, I explore through the problem of um, uh, economic inequalities in, in the market. And I, I, I then kind of trace what happens to these markets in the 80s and the 90s and how these NGOs uh, ended up importing a lot of these ideas um, to Britain itself to work with um, ethnic minorities, so specifically Afro-Caribbean communities and uh, Pakistani uh, communities. Um, and, and the reification of, of, of these markets, the problem of, of them trying to produce a certain type of um, authentic producer um, uh, third world producer, so really kind of like stabilizing a certain relationship between the global north and the global south as um, uh, through that. So th that's just a, a little bit about um, solidarity. <laughs> I, I'm gonna sidestep the bait here, yeah, <laughs> which yeah. is that, I mean, I think that what you are doing is interrogating solidarity, you know, the book's called The Solidarity Economy, so I think yeah, what yeah. you just did is, is, yeah, yeah. is an example of that, and I think that's also perfectly fair for you to not know what it is. Yeah. And I think that connects really interestingly for me to Hiba's work. And I was thinking about it because when you were talking about when you were talking about the solidarity markets, I was thinking there is on one side you have the intellectual origins and the intellectual history of a concept mm -hmm. and we're framing that. <laughs> and then there's the banal everydayness of the repression and the extremely terrible conditions that So I, I really appreciate that uh, question. I appreciate being here with you all. Um, and I appreciate following uh, my colleagues because like them, I'm a little bit ambivalent about the, the idea of solidarity. Um, and the reason is that I think of it more as interconnectedness, right? Um, so, and I'll give you examples from both, uh, you know, the book Refuge um, that we started with, but also from my current work. So. In Refuge, the argument that I make or the idea that I um, am thinking about is that we have this idea that when people are resettled or uh, offered asylum, um, when they arrive to one of these wealthy Western countries and they're given regal legal recognition, that they're somehow saved, they've made it, right? In this global imaginary of displacement, that that's sort of the salvation. But what I show in the case of the United States, and the book is comparative across countries, but just focusing on the United States, is that people though selected for humanitarian reasons in these countries where they're uh, resettled from, so they, they flee Syria, they go to Jordan, uh, Lebanon, or Turkey in the case of the book, um, you know, though they're selected for humanitarian reasons there, something happens in the transatlantic flight where they're coming into the United States, which is that they become racialized subjects, right? They become sort of subject to American welfare policy. And if you know anything about American welfare policy, it is animated by anti-blackness. And so what ends up happening is that people through this transatlantic flight become transformed to workers, become transformed to people who, who are imagined to be uh, burdens on the state and become pushed into low-income positions that are very, very difficult to work your way out of. So the promise of American resettlement becomes a promise of American poverty, which I'll tell you is no 
one's salvation, right? So that's one example. The second example from my current work, which is on the cost of borders, is how the Israeli occupation of Palestine in Gaza and in the West Bank means that Israel operates with impunity, which means that Israel, despite being a state about the size of Massachusetts, is one of the top 10 producers of arms uh, in the world, right? The global exporters of arms in the world. Um, the AI industry is one of the top period in the world, and it's fueled entirely by the occupation. They are trying out this weaponry, this technology on people who, who they're not accountable to, right? Because of the occupation, because of the impunity with which they operate. And as a result of that, we have the iron wall, for instance, that's built that kept people in Gaza in. Every child born in Gaza was born behind that wall, which means every child was born already uh, a, perceived to be a danger already with their life opportunities cut at the knees just in utero, right? Just because of who they are, which is a racist um, you know, crime against humanity, as you can imagine. But also in the West Bank, we have the trial of facial recognition technologies that then become exported globally, right? So you can find the same kinds of weaponry that are used against Gazans at the US southern border. You can find it, Frontex uses it to stop people who are going over the Aegean Sea, including Palestinian refugees. So I've spoken to people who have confronted this twice, three times, right, on their way in, in their life at the border of Gaza and then again um, as they're entering uh, the, the European Union to try to seek refuge from the, uh, from, from the uh, destruction of their lives, you know, from the long-term destruction of their lives in, in, in an open-air prison. And so as we talk about these things, interconnectedness is a much more interesting concept to me because, you know, if we recognize that these same occupation technologies are actually being used against black and brown people everywhere, the same exact technologies. If we recognize that when you imagine black people as being less than human, that anybody else entering the country becomes categorized in terms of anti-blackness, right? That the racist system in this country impacts us all, that under the banner of white supremacy, we are all experiencing some version, obviously with variations, of the similar kinds of oppression, right? Then Solidarity just becomes, true solidarity just becomes a recognition of shared fate, right? Where we are recognizing that we all have something to lose when one of us is being hurt by the same kinds of structures of oppression that cast us all as sort of valueless, as dehumanized, um, as other, as dangerous, you know, as somebody to be antagonized, as somebody to be cast out, put behind a wall, put in a prison, or killed, right, with impunity. And so as we are having this conversation, I think that centering that conflict, centering interconnectedness, centering the dispossession is where it's interesting because then in order to become possessed, in order to actually have solidarity, that is a fight. It is not something that somebody's gonna give you. It's not, you know, standing and doing kumbaya. It's not saying we stand in solidarity with. It's not a hashtag on Twitter. It's an actual fight against systems that have oppressed us all and people are going to lose things, right? It is not going to be a costless fight. And so, you know, and this is something that comes up a lot for me with academics who sit silently as a genocide's happening because what about your careers? And it's like, fuck your careers. Right. And so and so but this is but this is exactly this is exactly where we're at because people are misrecognizing what is actually going on. OK, I'll stop there. Uh, oh, OK, you guys are making it really easy for me to connect to like flow from one to the other. Um, so Chitra, your book is about the voices of political prisoners and Hiba just redefined the prison in a sense, in many ways. Um, the crossing of a border um, in a racialized United States is a prison. Gaza is an open air prison, as is Kashmir, as are many places in the world. Um, it, even if from an abolitionist perspective, let's, you know, and, and through this broader redefinition of the prison and maybe for one moment, let's not do the intellectual exercise <laughs> of thinking, what does the pr word prison mean? Um, I, I could not help but think that, <coughs> about the, I like, wonder about the connection with people who, who have so little space in actual reality, in actual prisons, and no possibility of crossing borders they're sort of like in a borderless world, in, in, a, in a sense, in a, in, in, a, in a completely, in a, you know, in, 
statist um, environment. And, and what about the category of the political prisoner is particular, is also something that I'm thinking. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, what, what is the question? Uh, the question is, what is the prison <laughs> when, we, when we're thinking about it now in terms of okay. political prisoner? Right. Um, I think it's very important. I think we're all, um, I th we are living in a time where definitions no longer matter. <laughs> Language is failing us in ways that is impossible for us to articulate what does it mean for us to think about a prison. Let me start with the idea of the prison because um, somebody said, you know, Gaza is an open air prison, Kashmir is an open air prison. And then the other day, a friend was like, yeah, but again, the language of incarceration, carcerality means that somehow entire populations uh, are meant that they were actually, they, there's a, there was a crime that was committed by just existing, right? So, um, so I think we are in this time where the language that we use just is devoid of meaning. So in terms of India's political prisoners, um, I think it's very important for us to understand that the language of political prisoners is not something that is popularized in India. The language of political prisoners is not popularized in, in the United States. For example, we don't think of Julian Assange as a political prisoner of the West, right? Uh, somehow the idea of political prisoners, the way the narratives have been sold to us, only belong to certain regimes. If you talk about authoritarianism or fascism, we do not locate them within the wo world's oldest democracy, the only democracy in Middle East, or the world's largest democracy, right? So what do all of these terms mean? Um, in terms of this book, I think, I, I wanna be very quick. This book, I think a better way to answer this question would be the first question about how did you start this book and where did it end? Initially, this book was simply supposed to be a collection of prison writings from Indian political prisoners. So who are India's political prisoners, at least the way that we define in our books? These are people arrested under a series of laws under India's terror infrastructure. These laws are everything from laws like POTA, which um, which has now been repealed, but mirror the American Patriot Act, um, the UAPA acts, basically laws that criminalize an individual for simply not only dissenting, but simply existing as a citizen and exercising their citizenship rights. So we are not even talking about dissent in the way of someone um, trying to um, someone trying to do something against the state. We are looking at people who are being arrested for simply existing and exercising citizenship rights. And the reason that we wanted to do this is that since, not that a political prisoner is something that is very specific to the Narendra Modi regime, India has had its political prisoners from 1940. India's first political prisoners began, begins in 1949. Two years after independence, the first group of people who are protesting, organizing workers are being arrested. So India has a long history of having political prisoners. But something changes in all of these years. Now you have an infrastructure of laws that can criminalize people simply existing as citizens. Today we have laws that can simply pick up uh, a subject because this idea of citizenship is completely eroded, that anyone within the borders of India can today be picked up. The right to habeas corpus for all purposes is completely gone, can be picked up and disappeared. So the idea of prison no longer makes sense because what does it mean for us to think about people who are not citizens, not even subject, but simply bodies that can be disappeared? Again, these connections are not just, uh, these are not just connections within India. Uh, I wanna also make the larger question and connections with what happens because everything somehow seems to be connected to Palestine and Israel. In 2009, I was living in, um, I was living in Cairo running a legal aid clinic uh, and this is when Operation Cast Lead happens and then um, going into Gaza for the first time, I realize what is happening. In West Bank, the first, my second day in West Bank is in, in this village of Nilin where we are going to protest a young boy who was then the youngest Palestinian boy to be killed. And then the, the tear gas that hits the crowd that I was there is the exact same make of tear gas that ends up being used in Tahrir Square as, as Egyptians are again out on the streets in 2010. The same tear gas by the same company, the same United States government then gets used in Ferguson. The exact same tear gas is then again sold to Kashmir in 2014, 15, and 16. So even if you look at something like tear gas, the connections start everywhere. Similarly, the surveillance uh, tools used Pegasus, which have been used 
to uh, place evidences to incriminate India's political prisoners, again, originates uh, out of Israel. Just as the surveillance tools used, uh, the facial recognition that Heba talks about that is used in uh, West Bank and Gaza are the same technology that is now being used in Hyderabad, which is very similar to Cop City. Mm -hmm. So what you're really seeing is this global erosion of citizenship rights. So the prison is no longer just the prison, but rather every single individual, whether it's India, whether it is Palestine, whether it's the United States, whether it's the UK, it doesn't matter. We are no longer citizens. Our citizenship rights are being increasingly eroded. We are no longer not even, so from citizenship, from citizenship rights we've become data surveilled bodies that are consuming subjects. And from that now we are becoming bodies that can easily be disappeared. The laws in the United States that can today disappear people like Guantanamo, where we have a category of forever prisoners, are exactly the laws that can be used to disappear any one of us here in, this, in the United States. The same laws can disappear young Palestinian boys as young as five years old to military tribunals. The same laws that disappear Indians uh, or Indian citizens and subjects and again disappear them away. So I think we really need to understand that language of the prisons, the language of solidarity. We are living in times when language really doesn't make any sense. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh, to intellectual historians standing on the sitting on the stage and you're just you know saying language doesn't matter. And you know, the funny thing is when you were when you when you said that, I I was like, wait, am I do I disagree or do I just think that it's important to trace it? Um, and I do <laughs> think it's important to trace it because if we tr when we trace it, we find incredibly surprising things, um, such as you know the very long history between India and Israel, right? Um, and I was I was thinking of another example that that came to my mind was um, uh, Richard Titmus and uh, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but I assume that's it. <laughs> and 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 Julius Nyerere in Tanzania's prime minister. Um, and their village-based vision of socialism. Now, Nairari's legacy, as we know it, or if we're taught it, if you know anything about, uh, about Nairari, is very different to the sort of narrative that he is in, which is, which is really with Richard Titmus. And this is about welfare services, essentially, that were happening, that were being set up in Israel exclusionary welfare services, of course, um, but welfare services nonetheless. And this is the pickle, right, that tracing it, tracing the solidarity economy in this particular instance, re reframes a relationship and even a, and a historical actor. Um, and I kind of wonder what, what is the nature of the actor or the subject then? Um, in, in, in your work, but then also in everybody else's. We can love to start with you. How do we? Uh, just to clarify, what's the nature of, of the subject? Which subject, Richard Titmus or the welfare uh, recipient? How do we think about the subject in this particular context? Oh, I. So Nerere is a subject. No, I thought it was just uh, what what is our role as subjects within this, and what what kind of agency can we <laughs> reclaim? Uh, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just gonna riff and, and see what what comes, because <laughs> I have a very unmitigated, uh, very so. First of all, solidarity. Uh, solidarity. Uh, a, a lot of it developed during uh, the the creation of the welfare state. We can think of like. Ideas about solidarity are, you know, uh, are, are sort of the basis um, of the contract of the welfare state. But one of the things I look at is how that, you know, and I, I don't think it will be a surprise to anyone, and it will uh, tie very well with what Heba was talking about in the U.S. is that this, uh, the the way that welfare was actually being practiced, um, maybe there's something to say about how it was imagined. Um, was always racialized, right? So it was solidarity, but there were some people that you were in solidarity with and some people that you were not in solidarity with. You know, we cannot uh, disconnect the way in which uh, we imagine the, the whole 
as this. Uh, so, I mean, so I guess I, uh, what Kamal is, is, is referring to when he mentions Richard Titmus and Nyerere, I look at how a lot of um, the creation of the welfare state in Britain, and Britain is like very proud of, of its creation of the, you know, the NHS, it like holds it against Americans for not having welfare ser services properly. Um, a lot of it was based on a, on a very uh, colonial and post-colonial project in which uh, ideas could be tested um, and developed within a colonial context and then would be racialized in particular ways um, in Britain. And I look at how in Israel uh, uh, a lot of welfare thinkers uh, from Britain went and applied ideas about welfare, um, but it was applied in particular racialized ways of um, imagining the uh, white kind of kibbutzim movement uh, to be uh, the recipient of welfare and uh, very much erasing um, any type of both Palestinian Israeli as well as Palestinian that are not, not Israelis, you know, um, um, uh, as, as part of this vision. And then I also look at how they helped build uh, African socialism in Tanzania, for, for example, and that also has its own racialized uh, formations. Uh, I do want to say something about like intellectual history or history of ideas and, and um, whether ideas matter or not. I have a very difficult, complicated relationship with that because I really like uh, reading, as an academic I really enjoy reading histories of ideas, but um, I, in a way I don't think that they can fully answer the type of questions that, <laughs> that I ask. So I think uh, I always want to see what happened in practice and I think political economy is the only way that we can answer that. But I do think that there is something to be said about tracing ideas um, if we want to flex our muscle of political imagination. And I think that's where there is, I mean, I don't think that that would be necessarily the, the solution to everything, but I think that there's a lot of really interesting work um, on histories of decolonization that don't just look at uh, the effect or how decolonization was practiced, but also look at different types of political ideas of decolonization and futures that could have been taken and possibilities that could have been taken. So there's something to be said, I think, about like looking at, and I, 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 I'm not gonna be the one who's gonna be talking, I think, here about the, uh, defending the possibility of solidarity, because I think that w we might wanna enter into it well, uh, other concepts like justice. <laughs> Um, and I think the problem with solidarity is that a lot of times it stops. It, it's kind of much more structural. Th there's some things that need to be corrected beyond just um, emotional, ethical solidarity. Um, and you need political and structural justice in order to correct them. Um, but I do think that uh, there's some visions and ideas that are worth historically exploring and to both understand why those possibilities or alternatives weren't taken, but also to think what is possible from now on, not in a naive way, but also in a way that, how do we, yeah, I don't know, amend. Um, I'm sorry, well, it's a rare occasion that I'm not loud enough. Um, and that's, that's a situation where the idea is out there, right? I've been thinking about, say, in, your, in your last answer, um, Tehila, the, I've been thinking about the ideas that are not out there at all. And one of the things that I did not realize, actually, when I was reading the books, I only realized this now, is that there's a strange way that technology appears in every single one of your books. And access, disavowal, acce accession to it, or technology transfer between countries, that doesn't often have words sometimes when it's happening. Or we have to look at it you know, in, in retrospect, and we have words for it, right? But we can look at it now, and there's a word technology that we can apply to, to lo lots of things. And uh, Azad, I guess I'll start with you in terms of the technology transfer between India and Israel, because I think a lot of that was a surprising. Um, you know, that is very fine-grained journalistic insight. But 
you know, how do you begin to think about the access to technology as informing how how we should think ethically? You know what I mean? Like, it, it was transfer was the transfer of technology like a really key moment in understanding that relationship for you? No. <laughs> no, look, look. Um, it, the, the, there are different ways of like understanding technology as well, right? And so the first transfer of technology takes place in the 60s between India and Israel. And it takes place when um, India goes to war with China. Of course, China calls it a skirmish, India calls it a war. Um, take what you want from that. And um, essentially, India is battling on the Himalayan mountains, and uh, Nehru sends a letter out to several leaders around the world, including Ben-Gurion, and he asks for help. And um, Ben-Gurion writes back and says, okay, we'll offer you these ammunitions and these mortars and all these things. And Nehru replies and says, you can please send us this material, but don't send it on ships that have your flag, essentially. So send it on unmarked ships. And so Ben-Gurion uh, refuses, and that relationship starts. Um, and 65, India and Pakistan go to war. And um, they, you know, Israel helps out India again in 71 when India and Pakistan go to war again regarding you know, uh, what would become Bangladesh. Um, you know, Israel helps out. And the, the relationship that develops, you know, to answer your question, it develops under the covers. You know? it's, it's, there's no normalization between India and Israel. Um, and it's essentially just a military technological sort of transfer that takes place. Um, and what's crucial is that um, it becomes very clear, you know, th you know what Heber was also mentioning, and um, with regards to Israel exporting, you know, uh, technology around the world, it's not exporting a gadget; it's exporting a methodology. So it's a way of doing something, right? And that starts all the way from the 60s. So in 1967 like or 68, when Indira Gandhi becomes, you know, prime minister, um, she sets up RAW and Mossad from her office, like a, like a, a meeting, uh, sort of like a, a direct line between the two intelligence um, uh, agencies. And then that sets up um, you know, military training between the two armies, right? And there's no relationship, formal relationship between the two. And it's only until 1992 that India and Israel you know, formalize relations. But by then, they're already trading with regards, with regards to arms and um, with regards to um, technological transfer. You know, it's 2000 and, what is it, 2024. In 1984, what's that, 40 years ago, um, there was the massacre at, uh, in Amritsar, right? At the, um, at the Gurudwara there, right? And, um, in, in, and those Indian forces that went into Amritsar, right? They, an uh, Operation Blue Star, Operation Blue Star, right? Um, when they went in, th they, had been they had been trained by Israelis, right? And so all of that information is now coming out. So when you talk about the ethics, right, there's no ethics when it comes to technological transfer. It's all about money, right, all about capitalism, right? And the relationship between India and Israel that develops over the 80s and the early 90s and, and, and moving forward is actually predicated on India joining the global capitalist economy. It's based, based on that. And so when India wants to join the global capitalist economy, Zionists in the U.S. tell India, or tell uh, now it's Rajiv Gandhi, you know, it runs in the family, um, tells the Rajiv that, listen, if you want to get close to the U.S., you need to go through Israel. That's, that's the way, right? And, um, and so that relationship de develops, obviously, in, in, um, in New York, and, you know, we move on from there. And the relationship again develops um, post-9-11, in which now India uh, well, joins the war on terror, Right, and now they're fighting these savage Arab Muslims, you know, in the neighborhood or in the Middle East, and uh, that technological transfer is now predicated on that as well, yeah. um, on, on the expansion of the war on terror. And then, obviously, under Modi, the relationship now moves on to another plane because India, under Modi, wants to be an ethno-nationalist, militaristic state like Israel, unashamedly, right? Yeah. And so, t you know, to do that, it needs to become as close to Israel as possible um, because of the technological transfer. Now, if you want to know where we are right now, um, just last week, the Indian, uh, sorry, the Israeli, Israel Aerospace Industries, which is the, one of the bigger uh, state-run um, weapons companies in Israel, they just 
uh, signed a memorandum of uh, agreement with Indian, with India's uh, Institute of Technology, IIT in Delhi, right? Now imagine doing a genocide, right? A university signing a relationship about technological transfer. And, and the idea there is like, okay, you think about, okay, why would they be doing this at this point? And that's really about creating, you know, from the Israeli side, creating new kind of uh, ecosystem of patronage. If you think about the, the, um, the problems that we are seeing in the U.S. with regards to trying to raise the story of, the pa of Palestinian rights, right? I mean, the base, now, now I'm getting to self-determination, right? Just like human rights, right? Um, and at the struggle at the universities where the students are trying to divest. Um, the, the Israel can see that there's an end in sight, possibly in the U.S., when it comes to the relationship and the tie, ties with Israel. And so it's now moving to other places to develop these technological ties in which it knows it can get away with working and building new ties uh, that don't r need any kind of ethics, you know? So now, so that's where we are. So that kind of answers your, your question. Yeah, um, Hibba, do you mind following up on that? You know, in a way, I'm just curious about your new book project, which is, is in a certain way, technology, like you, you refer to the arms production, right? That is, that is, of course, technology. But of course, also all the sorts of things that Azad just mentioned. Is technology not the conduit or the bar that by which we can look at something structurally and begin to understand it? I mean, I, I don't know if technology is the conduit. I think that these are relationships of oppression. I mean, you know, they've existed for long periods of time. Again, it you know, as as I said, it depends on how you define technology, right? There have always been technologies of oppression, technologies of occupation. Um, but I do think that the proliferation of tech is fascinating in and of itself, because you know, you know, the idea of the, the the tear gas is really interesting, which is like an actual object which is used in different places. But also, you know, and and, and to your point, right? It, the processes are being exported in ways that are, you know, the facial recognition technology isn't just used at borders, right? It's being used in malls. It's being used in, in its in in and the way it's the way that this technology is diffusing is through through is through our private lives as well. It's through the sort of day to day, you know, through our interactions with or how we walk, you know, we're walking through worlds that are structured by this tech. And so again, I think that the question that is most interesting to me is how that proliferates, how that becomes something that is impacting us all on a day-to-day -day basis, how an occupation, how, you know, that has an impact on us as we're, we're sitting here, um, and how we fight it. And I think, you know, you know to, to your work, I feel like, you know, the question of abolition becomes really important, right? And abolition sounds radical, it sounds, um, you know, like something that is some, you know, that we, a conversation that seems sort of out of left field, that is a marginal conversation. But as we're talking about, you know, what does it mean to have this technology developed on people who cannot contest it and then to have it used on us all, right? What does it, how does the erosion or the erasure of one person's humanity then shape everybody's fates, right? And so those are the kinds of questions that I'm sort of most interested in answering. And I mean, I am not an intellectual historian. I am a sociologist. So terms are only as useful as they are identifying things that we can then, you know, change or we can then talk about. Um, so for me, that is the question that's most interesting here is the question of abolition. And the question is sort of how that tech or how those weapons of oppression, whatever they may look like, whether that be carceral technologies, which the United States, again, has developed a process that has been used in other places, whether they be, you know, technologies of, of uh, also carceral technologies in terms of Guantanamo, in terms of disappearing people, which you talked about. You know, the, the idea, I find the ITT thing so fascinating. I miss that piece of news. And I think it's so telling, right? As our students are literally, you know, I'm at, I'm at, um, I'm at CUNY Hunter and our students are literally being vilified for protesting. Our students are literally being vilified across the United States for calling for divestment. And the, the solution is to pivot in a way that, you know, where, where, uh, for more easy oppression, right? I mean, it's, and this is again, what we're talking about is that these are all connected fates. And this is, 
this is the conversation that I think it's really is really useful to have and how we then coordinate um, you know, what kind of coordination, and you want to call that solidarity, be my guest, right, <laughs> is, 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 is the strategy to, to resist, right? How do we actually resist this that, you know, in the way that it's impacting us and the way that it's working? I don't know if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> on abolition. I feel like that, that was like really difficult. <laughs> I mean, just the idea, I think, I mean, I, I mean I'm not going to summarize it, but it was just really, really well put. And I, the utility of the, of, of, the, of the idea is very much in how it's deployed, deployed, of course. And that, I think, is something that all of you will agree on, despite being from very different disciplines. You might want to have the mic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. No, I, I don't need the mic anymore. I, feel, I think that we should take questions um, at this point. Sorry, did anyone have questions? Uh, yeah, I no. thoughts on abolition. No, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, my thoughts on abolition. Um, I have very mixed thoughts on abolition because um, I was born and raised in India, but I've lived outside of India since I was 17, and I've lived in the United States since 2010. So abolition was an idea that I was introduced here, mm -hmm. and mostly through incredibly brilliant uh, black scholars in this country, and I understand why it makes sense in the United States. And what was very interesting for me is that every time I talk about abolition to anybody who doesn't come from the racialized histories um, of the United States, abolition always seems to feel very different. So uh, because initially my, I, I assumed that the idea of abolition would have a global resonance. Mm -hmm. And increasingly, when I talk to uh, activists um, across, there are aspects of abolition that they want to take. At the same time, there are certain ideas that they feel might not, because the American racialized concept of the penal system and incarceration is so completely different that there was once this conversation where um, this activist that I know said that, listen, a lot of the Dalit activists in India look to the abolitionism ideas to think about all prisoners as political prisoners. But at the same time, these languages does not always translate and always perfectly. So I think there is a lot for us to think about and learn. Um, and I think that's why I think the ideas of solidarity kind of comes in is that for me, the word solidarity, maybe all four of us would be the academic root and write a book called Against Solidarity, <laughs> which would be we would start soliciting essays on this and then, you know. But no, I think the reason why solidarity increasingly becomes a tenuous word is because if I say I stand in unconditional solidarity with Palestine or Kashmir, me as, uh, as, a, as someone who was born in India and now lives in the United States with an American citizenship, what material loss am I suffering? It's the same with the performance of privilege when people talk about, oh, I am so privileged. What does it mean for us to articulate my privilege? Because just because I articulate my privilege, that doesn't mean I have made a material difference to somebody who is not as privileged. So acknowledgement of privilege is just the beginning of consciousness, but me acknowledging my privilege or me claiming unconditional solidarity does not make material difference. As long as our actions does not cost us, I don't know what the solidarity means. On the other hand, what makes more sense to me is the idea of communities and resistance. When we, I think communities and resistance, whether it is um, uh, Palestine, Kashmir, Ferguson, Gaza, communities and resistance often have more to learn from each other, which goes to the idea that authoritarian regimes and regimes of oppression and occupation often learn from each other, while communities and resistance often uh, it's a failure that all of us have to acknowledge. So for me, the idea of communities and resistance makes more sense. And again, I'll end with Palestine because the first time I was in West Bank was in 2008. And then again, I spent the summer of 2008 and the summer of 2009 in West Bank. And this was the first time I was encountering a system in which a person with an Indian passport traveling, I've always felt a certain disadvantage. It was the only place in the world where there were two lines in which me with an Indian passport could pass through in 30 seconds as we take the bus from Jerusalem to Ramallah, while I would see Palestinians just standing in line for hours and hours. And then you realize that the idea of time, territory, and history is foundational to all of this. And then in 2014, when I was in Kashmir for the first time, 
the geographies of oppression was so similar. I was traveling from Srinagar to Bandipur, and for the first time I felt it felt familiar because all of a sudden, the memory of the geographies of oppression and apartheid that was familiar in West Bank is now reimposed in Srinagar, right? From when you travel, you see certain, the, the, the checkpoints, the thing, it hadn't become as racialized. And then in 2019, when Article um, 370 was revoked, there was an article that, that appeared where somebody said, you know, every day I leave my house uh, to go somewhere, by the time I come back, I can't use the same way to come back because the city itself was made so alien to the people who live there, which is exactly what happens to Palestinians in, in West Bank, in the occupied territories, in Gaza. The idea that you could emotionally, physically remake a geography that a person so intimately knows, that is geographies of oppression that is again being learned. So I think communities, the idea of something like communities and resistance, I feel is more... It resonates more with me than the language of solidarity simply because with solidarity, I am I could say solidarity and not lose. Nothing could affect my material difference. There's no material materiality. I'm not using I'm not losing anything by simply claiming solidarity. Um, Iman, how many questions do we have time for? Six questions. Okay. Um, uh, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, that's a sign. That's not a number. <laughs> not, not a number of questions. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> let's be to the rest. Um, yeah, who would like to ask yeah. a question? I, I need to like squint to see who. Do we have any questions? No questions, we just answered everything. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> okay. <coughs> okay, wait, is it is it because she's it is six fifty and that's why Oh it is, yes. Oh. Okay. Fair fair enough. Um <laughs> is six fifty, yes. Uh, so